Hello, everybody. James here, WSI. I'm not even going to give this guy a full intro because you know who he is. It is Mr. USA, the Black Superman, Tony Atlas. Let's see the guns. Ah, oh, they're still massive. They're still massive. How big are they now? Uh, I stopped measuring uh, when I stopped bodybuilding. So the last time I measured my own, uh, my last contest was the AAU uh, Mr. America contest uh, in White Proud in, in our, our New York. And so after I stopped bodybuilding, I stopped keeping up with my measurement because what happened in bodybuilding at the beginning, they had, uh, they were judge you by body parts. That's the reason why I became Mr. USA because that they would come out and see who had best arms, best uh, best arm, best chest, best back, most muscular, best abs, and best legs. So they have on like six divisions that you can win. So I used to always, believe it or not, I used to win best arm, best chest, and most muscular because I was, I had like a 4% body fat, you know, I was real, had thin skin like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So you can see all the striation in my chest and when I did my bicep, you can see all the striations. But I never won best abs and I never won, of course, I never won best legs, you know, it's, it's <laughs> obvious, you know. But uh, now, and then a guy came along by the name of Frank Zing. And once Zing became, then, the, then they started going for the most symmetrical body. So what it is, you are now your chest have to, if your chest is 16 inches around, then your thighs got to be 30 inches. If your biceps is 20 inches, your pads got to be at least 19 inches. So they, they start looking for more and more of a symmetrical look. Now, believe it or not, Arnold Schwarzenegger today will not win because his chest was about 60 some inches around, but Arnold had 28 inch thighs. You see what I'm saying? He yeah, had, yeah. His, his, his calves matched his arm. He had like a 22 or a 21, 22 inch bicep, but he also had like 19 or 20 inch calves. So, so his arms and calves matched up, but his thighs, his quadriceps did not match uh, the measurement of his chest. So to Sergio Olivia would have won uh, back uh, back in the day. Uh, a lot of guys would not have, uh, Lou Ferrigno would not have won uh, Mr. Olympia in today's time because his legs were not as developed as his upper body. Mm. And my legs were not as developed as my upper body. Uh, but now it's symmetrical now. With uh, uh, This is one of the further on down questions I was going to ask, but well, let's go there straight away. So I used to do a podcast with Don Morocco, and he claimed that his arms were bigger than Hulk Hogan's at the time. Do you sort of agree with that? And who in the 80s had no. the biggest arms? No. See, here's the reason why. Uh, something that is six feet with the same measurements as something that is ten feet. The six feet gonna look uh, bigger because it, it it's shorter in length. So just looking at it with the human eye, you know, not saying that Don is wrong, just looking at it with the human eye, yes, his arm was uh uh it's bigger. You like you just look at, it. but if you took a tape and measure it, then you would find out it's not true. I did a thing one time in the dress room with Andre the Jack. Now my arm was twenty three and a half inches towards the end, but this early in my career when I was in Charlotte, and my arms at that time was uh twenty one and a half. So everybody said. Uh, I went over, me and Andre was like this. I mean, for some reason, Andre loved me. I, I don't know why, but he just, I always made him laugh. He thought that I was the goofiest freaking guy he ever met in his life. Because you know me, I, I'm, I'm goofy. And Andre just loved me because I was always making him making him laugh. So anyway, I took a tape and uh, I went, I used to tease Andre. I think the reason why Andre liked me so much, because I always told Andre I had bigger arms. See, I asked Andre he, to, to go to the gym with me one day. And Andre the Jank say, uh, I'm big enough. And uh I, I Andre hated when you talk about his his uh his size. He always wanted to fit in, you know, with everybody else. And he said, a midget do not want to be told every day that he's short. He know he's short. He said, Well, the same thing with Jenks. I never thought about this. You know, us guys, we monster, so we figure if you brag about how big my arms are, how big this is, how big that is, it makes us feel good because we average person. But for a person already got that, 
you know, they always been looked upon as big. And, 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 and uh, he didn't like people to talk about his size. So I never, and when I did talk about his size, I used to always say, Andre, I got bigger arms than you. And from that day on, I became Andre very, very close friend. He told, he's got the last name uh, that I do. He was uh, a rough read. I uh, used to drive Andre around. He told this uh, Tim White. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yep, yep. Tim White. He said, I would like to be you for one day. Mm. I was sitting there listening to him tell him that. Because he would always, he said sometimes he felt like a, a animal in a zoo. Where the way people would look at him and, you know, so he always, Andre always wanted to just be fit in. That's why he was so generous with the money. But anyway, make a long story short, I, I, I went over and I measured Andre Arm. My arm was like 21 and a half inches at the time. Andre Arm, was, his bicep was, 20, was 22 inches around. Really? But on Andre, a 22-inch arm is not big. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. The same thing with Hoga. Dom, <laughs> excuse me, Don Morocco is six foot one, six two, but you know, a little bit around that six foot mark. Uh, I'm, uh, Hogan is six, 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 seven. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So for Hogan to um to look as big as Morocco, uh, Hogan would have to have twenty five or have to have like thirty inch arms. See, a twenty inch arm is not big on Hogan. In fact, he would look skinny with a 20-inch arm on Hogan. Well, he did look See? skinny. He did look skinny. Because I think in like the early 90s, he'd slimmed down considerably. But like all of them had slimmed down considerably. But he'd almost turned into like a swimmer's body for like a brief period in the 90s. So you well, really, really here, Here's the problem. Uh, I, I don't mind saying this. I'm not too smart. If you ever read my book, I got pushed. I had a head injury when I was six years old. A guy named Jerry Hayes pushed me into the creek. And if you ever see me in person, you're going to see a big dent right in the mud of, of my head. And uh, I, I remember my brother used to tease me all the time because I, I, be, uh, I became slow. Like, you would tell me something, I don't get it right away. It would take me maybe a week for you to try to really, un I, I'm serious, yeah. to, for things to really. because I, My mother said I, I was a slow learner. Ever since my accident, my brother used to pick on me all the time. And my mom said, now y'all leave him alone now, because since that accident, he he never been the same. So I, I pick up on things later, it, more more than than, than, than uh, sooner. That's why a lot of time when I do interview, I always apologize for things that they because that time my brain would not. Die. I was 20 years old when I finished high school. Wow. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The teacher told me, he said, if I, if, if I don't finish this year, he said, I have to pay to come back. Wow. You know, I was always a very, very slow learner. And and I was never a good wrestler, a worker. I was a good listener, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would put, in the older days, they would put an experienced wrestler with an inexperienced wrestler. And you have to listen to what they say. That's why the best guy that, that I had my best matches with, wrestling match, cause, you know, was with uh, Harley Race. And that, the thing about Harley Race, when people always brag about Harley Race, because Harley Race could work with a 300-pound man and have a great match, and Harley Race could work with a 200-pound man and have a, a great match. Now, people talk about Ric Flair. Ric Flair, uh, we call repetitious, mm -hmm. which means if you saw one of his matches, you don't need to see no more. Hogan, my very best friend, repetitious. His match is never changed, but if you watch Harley, Harley never had the same match. Mm -hmm. You know, there were very few guys in this business that was not what they call repetitious. Mm -hmm. You know, I was watching the Hogan match one time, it was a, and I was, we used to go out the bleacher, and we used to hide underneath the bleacher and watch the match before us because we didn't want to repeat what was done before. So every wrestler in the old day would watch the match before there so they don't do the same thing. So, like, if you go out there and you work a headlock, then I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna work the arm. And the next guy would come out and work the leg. But we didn't want, and that's why people don't like wrestling now, because it's written by one person. But right? one person got one idea, you know? Yeah. So every match is gonna be similar, gonna have a similarity because it's coming out of one thing. It, it's kind of like Kool-Aid. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you got green Kool-Aid, you got red Kool-Aid, but the taste 
It's still pretty much the same. <laughs> Whereas if you go to like, there's a difference between ginger ale and Coca Cola, mm. but but it's no it's no difference between Coca Cola and Pepsi. They you know, and that, and that's what and that's what what is missing because what Vince the Vince McMahon. I know I'm all over the place, but you no, know, no, no, me. no. Yeah, like right now with Vince McMahon, none of the wrestlers can work. But Vince don't want them to learn how to work. This is this is, uh, because what Vince does, they write out everything on a piece of paper or what they want to do. Every move is written out. Every word that comes out of their mouth is written out by a couple of writers. So it's not coming from the wrestler himself. It's coming from whoever Vince hired to write that match. Whereas in the olden days, the only thing they would tell you in the olden days, because we have separate dressing rooms, you know? You'd have so referees they, they, go they, back and forth, wouldn't you? Huh? You'd have like referees the, the, the go referee back and forth did. to pass messages. Yeah, you're right. They, yeah, they used a the referee because he was the only one who could walk out in front of the crowd and go from dressing room to dressing room about people. See, I my uh, when I first started, George Scott took in, in uh, Anderson, South Carolina, where I had my first match, July the 10th, 1975, was my first match. They would give you other matches, but they call them what they call them, like dark matches, you know, to get used for crowd. He said, Tony, let me tell you something. He said, every person out there believe that wrestling is fake. It is your job to prove that it's not. So we, if you have a match and people forget, a good worker is like this. You go to a horror movie. It's a horror movie, right? <laughs> and, the, and Jason is standing behind the door with a big old butcher knife. Now you are in a theater. You know you're in a theater. You know you at a movie. And then just as the girl go to open the door, you holler out, watch out. That's a good movie. Because mm -hmm. you forget. See, wrestling is turning fantasy into reality. So Vince eliminate, Vince, not Vince Sr., but Vince Jr., eliminate reality. He came into the, uh, because... People love fantasy because all of us, America, were raised in the world of fantasy. It started with Santa Claus. And for the first 12 years of every American life, they was in the world of fantasy. But that is like planting a seed in the ground. Every year you cut that, you know, you destroy that plant, but every year it comes back because that seed been planted. And whatever you put into a child while they're very, very young stays in that child for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So when we lose Santa Claus, we spend the rest of our life trying to replace Santa Claus. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what wrestling was all about. So people wanted to believe in something. We, we constantly look for something that we could believe in. So anyway, make a long story short, he says it's your job to make uh, people believe that what you're doing is for real. So we did certain things, like when you hear the term lay it in, that means do it for real. That's what it meant. Do it for real. One of the things, if you watch my press slam, one of the things that I used to hate for a guy to help me, you, there's a picture of me where the guy will hold his arms out like this. But they want the people to see that I'm doing it. If A lot of guys were pushing off the shoulders. Hmm. People could see that. So I said, don't push off. No matter what you do, I could get you up. Don't push off. And if they push off, I, if you ask anybody that worked with me, I used to get angry about it because I want the people to believe that what I did for real. Another thing that I, the little trick, they call it ring psychology. Another time I arrested George Tuton Harris. George Tuton, and we call him Bunk Harris. And uh, you know how the guys get up on the rope and hit the guy in the head 10 times? Yes. And the people yeah, would count. Yeah. I done that. George Scott come back and he was mad as hell at me. He said, Tony, you just, you just smartened up everybody in the audience. I said, what? The people were cheering. He said, yes, they cheer while you're doing it, but then they get in the car and this is what they say when they get in the car. Now, you know, that's fake. If Tony Atlas hit him that many times, he'd he kill him. No, he said, your arms, he said, you too big and too strong looking to throw that many punches. He said, never throw more in a in a 15-minute match. I don't ever want you to go past seven or eight punches. That's why you're watching the match. You don't see me throw a lot of punches. Yeah. Because no, this is how he explained it to me. He said, 
You, he, he asked me, he said, Tony, how much you been spread? At that time, I was doing about 525. I, I told him I'd do 500. He said, how big are your arm? I said, oh, about 21, 22 inches. He said, who in their right man going to believe that a guy could bench press 500 pounds, 22 inch arm, and hit a guy in the head 10 times and don't even leave a mark? <laughs> he said, if his wife hit him in the, in the face 10 times, she would leave a bruise. Either he the toughest SOB walking the face of her, or you the biggest wimp walking the earth. <laughs> he said, the more punches you throw, Tony, it don't make you look stronger. It make you look weaker. Mm -hmm. If you bigger than your opponent, the more you do to your opponent, the more you do to your opponent, the uh uh the weaker you look. It don't make you look stronger. So that's why the heel was always bigger than the baby face because the baby face could do a lot to him. I could hit a big man. If I'm fighting John Studd, I can do a lot more to John Studd than I could do to fit Finley to make it believable. Nobody gonna believe that. Fit Philly could take that type of punishment. This why in the older days, when I gave somebody a press slam, I'm 6'2", and I slammed him, the guy didn't get up. Because the people believe that if you got, if you really fail, because most people have been around people that fell off a, a roof, they have fell out, out, you know, put in, a, you know, out of a chair, and end up in the hospital. So they figure you're going to suffer something for being fallen from, let me see, 6'2", when I stretch my arm, what are you talking about, seven feet? Mm -hmm. so, you know, you, you fall seven feet out the air. Most people will believe that you get hurt. They won't believe that you could get up that easily. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. When Jimmy Slooker was 265, 270 pounds, when Jimmy Slooker jumped off the top rope, they used to carry him out in a stretcher, if you remember. Mm -hmm. Because nobody could believe that 270 pounds could fall on you and you get up. Now you go drop a 18 wheel on the guy, they get up and drop kick you. <laughs> Nothing is believable. See, a, a, a punch, a move is only effective as your opponent sells it. Ernie Ladd, you said, get the most mileage out of everything. I was wrestling Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch one time, and I was working his arm. You know, I would panel his arm, hit buttons on, do that thing's on. Well, anyway, Murdoch gonna get some heat on me. So Murdoch hit me with his with his you ever notice guys always work on the left. Mm -hmm. They work from the left. And he hit me with his right arm. He threw one punch with his left arm. He started selling it. Ah. Uh -huh. He took that, took his hand and stuck it down in his trunk so that he don't have to use it no more. And he, and he fought me, to, he finished the match with one arm. He never used that left arm. Because as soon as he do something with that left arm, people are going to say, uh-huh, see, I told you it was fake. See, our job was not to wrestle it. The best way to, to explain what I'm trying to say is like a musician. You know it's a trick to pulling the rabbit out the hat. Now, you would keep paying to see that trick until you know how it's done. Exactly. Once you learn how it's done, you're not going to do that no more. So that was our that was our thing. I, when I used to get juice, you know, we used to take razor blades and cut our head. You know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would we would stop at that time it was Seven Eleven. They didn't have all the convenience store there, but Seven Eleven was was around during the assembly. The guy would ask me, he said, "Tony, what beer do you drink?" They did not want to see me. They didn't want the fans to see me walking around a convenience store and I'm okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, when they usually do stuff like hurt somebody in the ring and you're supposed to be hurt, when you come in the dressing room, the boys got your bag packed in the older days. They would pack your bag for you. You would go in the dressing room, out the back door, in your car, out of town. They did not want one person to see that you are not hurt. Because if that one person, see, if, if one person see you hurt, a hundred people know. Because that one person going to tell at least 10 people, and them 10 people going to tell another 10 people. And by the time you come back to town, everybody know it, it was bullshit. Mm -hmm. So that that was, like, if I if you was a heel, a bad guy, and I'm babyface, good guy, and I, and I got this wonderful hotel that I like staying at. But you get there first. And you check in. And I see you checking in. 
I couldn't stay in that hotel with you. I couldn't ride with you. That's why right, I like watching your program because these guys are always talking. I'm going to tell you something that's, that is real strange. Oh. The only guys that anybody ever talk about for some odd reason are heels. Mm -hmm. 90% of the people being talked about are not the baby faces. Ain't that something? But I listen to heels talk about baby faces. We couldn't ride together. So how you know about I know nothing about the about the heels. I couldn't be around them. The only time that I was around Dutch Mantel was in the ring. You, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. I wasn't in a dressing room with in Puerto Rico. I, in Puerto Rico I was, but things were a little bit different. But like in the 70s, if I got caught with Dutch Mantel in the 70s, they would fire both of us. Yeah. You get fired <laughs> just to be around him. So they had separate dress room, and we had to stay separate all the time. We couldn't be around each other. If I go to a gym, and the heels are in that gym. I can't work on that gym. That to, back in the, my day, they were called an uh, expose. Mm -hmm. And that's why people used to ask the question, is wrestling fake? They knew it was, but they wasn't certain. It was always it was like the mask guy. Who's under that mask? You know? And, and we, kept, we always kept the people in suspense. So they kept coming back week after week after week not to watch the wrestling, but to catch us. Huh. Because we love to secede in America. And we're probably England too. It's not an American thing. It's a human thing. Mm. This, I've got to ask you this, right? So do you remember, um, this was before the Dr. D, um, John Stossel slap thing, but like in maybe around 80, 81, in the W, um, trying to think if even you were in the WWF then, but do you remember camera crews trying to catch out the wrestlers like in the 70s and 80s, turning up news cameras and stuff like that, trying to catch wrestlers out? Well, when we reverse, especially in the 80s, he put, he had these guys, he had everybody sign a certain contract. And nobody wanted to get sued by Vince. Vince knew how to protect, most promoters knew how to protect their promotion. So if you're a camera guy, you know, all that footage, everything in that building belonged to Vince. Mm. So you didn't have no access to it. Like when Vince have a meeting, he have a guy that's a uh, pet policy or, or, or uh, Chief J Strongbow or Tony Guerrero would stand at the door and all the wrestlers had to put their cell phone in this little basket. <laughs> you couldn't take, yeah, you couldn't take, take the cell phone into a meeting because we are, like you said, we are addicted to this phone. Mm -hmm. So you're going to send the picture to your girlfriend or to your best friend, right? Now, everybody knows what's going to go on before the show. And Vince be, Rastley believed in the ultimate of surprise, which means if uh, if the people already, like a movie, if you know how the movie's going to end, you're going to go see it? No. So that, you know, we have what we call ring psychology. But what Vince do, had writers to write things down for guys. That way, the new wrestler would never learn how to work. You can't plan a match in the dressing room. You can't plan a match in the dressing room and be successful out in front of the crowd. You don't know that crowd. Mm -hmm. You can have the greatest match in the world in New York City. Take that same match to Texas and it sucks. But people in Texas are not the same as people in uh uh, of, of New York. Yeah. That's why people say, well, I don't like the new wrestling. Because they don't know how to work the audience. You can't have one match to suit everybody in the world. Since the beginning of time, since the beginning of time, there had never, never, ever, never been a human being born with the same fingerprint or the same DNA. Unless they're identical twins. In which case, they don't have exactly. the same fingerprints, yeah. So that tells you right there that everybody don't have the same like. Mm -hmm. You love steak. I like steak. I like man medium. You like yours rare. You like, he like his well done, but we like steak. But I can't give everybody the same cook, cook the steak the same for everybody mm -hmm. and please everybody. That is wrestling. They used to tell me, listen to, we didn't know what we're going to do 
the only thing when I used to wrestle, I never knew what I was gonna do until I got in the ring. I knew who was gonna win. I knew who was gonna lose. That was it. We knew nothing else. We ad lib everything. That's why it was so realistic because we would listen to people. Like if I'm doing something and the people is liking it, I keep doing it. If I do something and they fought on it, I try to cover it up and get away from it as quick as I can. Mm -hmm. That's working. And then I would go to another uh, state. I go to another state and I would do a total different thing because that's it's not the same people. Mm -hmm. You see, and that what made old time wrestler so believable. We did less because by doing more, it's not believable. You ever watch a cartoon? When you're plenty. A kid, I'm plenty in the, roll, in the day, you watch yeah. Road Runner? Yeah, oh yeah. That's today's wrestling. Think mm -hmm. about it. The Road Runner pushed a big bowler on top of the coyote. He gets up. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. He runs over with a car. He gets up with the, with the threat marks on him. Mm. It is meant not to be believable. So what Vince did to make his wrestling what's called wrestling entertainment, he made it at, at least a believer as possible. You know? Yeah. Tony. He I... put belts. Yeah, he put belts on guys that can't whoop their way out of a wet paper bag. You know, Sean Michael and CM Punk just proved that. Hmm. How long did CM Punk match went? What in UFC? Yeah. Oh, not very long. Uh, yeah. One of them. <laughs> I'm going to blow your mind no. here with CM Punk, right? Yeah, yeah, he, he lost yeah, one. He yeah. lost one quickly in the first round, and then he was beaten handily in three rounds by the second worst UFC fighter of all time, which was then overturned into a no contest because the guy who beat him tested positive for weed. So technically, CM Punk is one zero one. Now, in 1975, if he had <laughs> lost, guess what would have happened to him? He would have been fired and then beaten up probably as well. No, he got fired. Yeah. Couldn't get, would not get booked. You could lose a fight to another wrestler in the older days, but not to a non wrestler. Mm -hmm. You could not lose a fight to Muhammad Ali and keep your job. You couldn't lose a fight to Mike Tyson and lose your job. You could lose a fight to Rick Flair. You could lose a fight to Bruce and Brody, but not a non wrestler. Tony, can I? Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have four questions, four pages worth of fan questions here. I'm going to start Come getting on, through I'm those, ready. man. Uh, right, and the first one is, and these are actually just a couple, a uh, couple from fans and also from me. We lost in the last month or two a couple of proper legends in the wrestling business. First one, superstar Billy Graham. Second one's the Iron Sheik. Uh, if you've got a superstar Billy Graham story for us to sort of encapsulate what he was all about, please uh, share it now. I was in a. Uh... Dallas, Texas, and the owner of the gym, there was back in the, uh, I don't know if it was the 70s or 80s, I'm not too sure about the year, uh, I was in a gym that was upstairs, and uh, the guy came up to me, and he showed me a picture of, of Billy Graham, and he said, you about the only guy that been in this gym that got arms as big as my friend, <laughs> and he said, you know what's down there, he pointed out the window, and I said, no. He said, that's where Kennedy was shot. You know, President <laughs> Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. So the gym was right on the same street that President Kennedy got stopped. The first time I met Billy Graham, me and him, we wrestled for Georgia's championship wrestling uh, at the, uh, uh, the the Atlantic City Auditorium. And he told me, he said, I'm going to tell Vince about you because he said, if you ever go to New York, he said, you will never lose a match. And me and Billy, we, you know, I didn't know him that well, but every time that we did, that I, that I ever was around him, I used to hang out with a guy called Scott Epstein. And Scott Epstein was Billy Graham's very, very best friend. And me and Scott Epstein were like brothers. You know, we were. I cried when Scott Epstein got killed in the park because I, I loved him so much. But uh, me and Billy, we saw each other like off and on, but we always talked about weightlifting. We talked about honor. He was always cheerful. Never had a bad word. You know, he always bragged about me. He always loved me. But I don't have a whole lot of story on uh, Billy Graham. But I do, um, I am happy because uh, Sue from WWE called me. They said they're doing a document on the Iron Sheep. 
and they'd like for me to be a part of it. And I was very, very excited about it. In fact, I drew a picture of me and the Aaron Sheik uh, wrestling where the Aaron Sheik got me in a dominant stretch to give to him. Like, remember when I did the dark side of the ring? I drew Bruiser Brody. So I like to draw pictures of people we talk about, and I don't sell it to the producer. I give it to them, you know, and then they hopefully you know, they would have that. But anyway, make a long story short, I first met the, the sheep in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he wasn't the sheep there. He was wrestling under his uh, uh, name. Yeah, did he still have the and hair I, and everything was, still? Right, and then he was with Ken Patero, and Ken Patero and Ann Sheep was two of the guys that helped break me into the business. The Iron Sheik was so tough that he would get down on the ground on all four, and you couldn't turn him over. Here's a guy, uh, 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 what's his name? You can ask him, too. He could tell you that. Uh, Kim Patero, first man, first American to pit 500 pounds over his head, could not roll the Sheik over. Tony Atlas, who was the Virginia powerlifting champion, could not turn the Aaron Sheik over. He just, he, he, you know, he was like, a, and he told me he was a show of Iran personal bodyguard. You knew that? Mm -hmm. And he never carried a weapon. He was the never weapon. Cared. He was the weapon. Another thing I want to tell you about Sheik, now, now this is a story that I really wanted to tell my whole life. Tommy Wildfire Rich and myself, we were driving one day, and Tommy wrecked the car. He, <laughs> the car flipped over, you know, because Tommy had a bad habit where he talked to you. I was sitting in the back seat behind Tommy. It was Tommy Rich for driving. Nick Patrick was sitting beside me. That's, I think, the Rilla Monsoon's son, Nick no, Patrick. No, no, Nick Patrick was uh, Jody Hamilton's son. Jody Hamilton's son, yeah. Nick Patrick was sitting beside me. And Johnny Rich, I think, was Tommy Rich's brother. I don't know if they were real brothers or just, you know, stage brothers. In the rest of it, you don't know when they say brothers. You know, I don't even know if it's Kane and, and uh, Undertaker are brothers. I don't know, you know. But that's just how the business is. But anyway, make a long story short, Tommy had a bad habit. He'd be driving, and you would say something to him, and he would do this. What are you saying, T? <laughs> just turn around. <laughs> so this time, I say something to Tommy. He turned around like this. When he turned back, I, I hear this. Oh, my God. The car was upside down when he said it. And we flipped three times. When, like I told you, the heels and babyface could not be together. Uh, only Anderson, part of the, the, he was tag team. It was no Orn Anderson then. Orn Anderson was not in the building. It was, first it was Laws and Gene Anderson. Mm -hmm. And then when Laws left, it became uh, Ole and Gene Anderson. So Ole was the booker at that time uh, in, 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 in uh, Georgia. And so Otis told the sheep, the sheep and them pull up and they saw the car in the banquet. And they was waiting for the jaws of death to cut me out. They couldn't get the door, but they couldn't get me out. So the sheep said, who's in the car? So they said, Tony Atlas is in the car. And uh, sheep said, I'll go help my friend. And Otis said, if you go down there, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> I will fire you if you go to help him. The sheep ran down the banquet ripped the door out off of the car and pulled me out. When I went to the house, brother, the doctor said, if they have not got me out when they did, I would have been paralyzed from the neck down. Wow. I had a broken neck. And he also told me, at that time, if you look at earlier pictures of me, because I was a wrestler, and real wrestlers got thick neck, real wrestlers, because we trained our necks. So uh, he said, if my neck was not as strong as it was, he said, I would have died. But if the sheik have not, Pull me out of that car, I would have been paralyzed. It would have been the end of my career. That's one thing the sheep did for me. Another time I was in Japan, and they had a shooter uh, called Paul Gotch. And he was one of the baddest people in Japan. And these guys, they would like beat you up for real in the ring. That's why you don't make no money. Nobody wanted to work with him. A car wouldn't work with you. It was more like a shoot work. More of a shoot than, than a work. So he was trying to pick a fight with me in Japan where the sheep liked him. So I don't know why. Uh, I, uh, but anyway, he stood up at the table. He said, oh, 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 oh Mr. Gotch, oh, Mr. Gotch, you don't want to fight my friend, a Tony of a Mr. of a USA of an Atlas. You, you, the, the, the car Gotch, you the tough guy. You take the sheep. 
You fight the sheep. I go to the gym with Tony Atlas. I have a thick neck. I don't have a pencil neck like you said about the Tony Atlas. You don't fight the sheep. You don't fight my friend. You mess with my friend Tony Atlas, you have to fight the sheep. God's back down. Really? Didn't want no part of the sheep. How old was Carl at the didn't time? Want no part of the sheep, brother. How, how old was Carl at the time? Two of the, yeah, the sheep stood up for me. Uh, stood up for me. Uh, 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 you know, and, and, and protected me. And me and him would be. And, and another story I want to tell you about the sheep is this too. Mm -hmm. So, when Bruiser Brody got stabbed in Puerto Rico, I wrestled a sheep that night. Really. And, the the way like I said, the, the people were separated. You had a baby face dressing room, you had a heel dressing room. So any heel, any heel that talk about Brody is telling a lie. You understand? Yeah. The heel fan out from the sheep. Because when I came back from the hospital, uh it pissed me off. I got pissed off. Uh because all the guys were laughing and joking. Like nothing happened. You know, that it was like it never happened. So that pissed me off when I hear the guys patting each other on the back and talk about what a great match they had and all this and that stuff and blah, 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 blah. So Carlos said, oh, I didn't expect you back. He said, so we could do your match. So he told the referee, go tell the sheep that Tony here, we could do his, do the match now. That match lasts probably about two minutes because not even that, I locked up with the sheep and the sheep heard about me, he didn't know the story. So he said, he said, oh, Atlas, uh, what happened with, the Brody. And I said, Jose stabbed him. Once I said that, the sheep said, hey, motherfucker stabbed my friend, the bruiser of a Brody. That motherfucker, give me a hit, but we go home. So I gave him a hit, but we fought back to the ring. And the sheep went to the, uh, the heel dress room and told the heels what happened. You understand? Yeah. But that's how we found out. Would you... So that's why I'm always seeing these guys talking about they was there and this way. I pulled Brody out of the shower. You understand? I hear mm -hmm. people say, well, Brody, Brody didn't say nothing to nobody but me. He came straight to me. I was sitting within six feet of him. I was the closest person to him when it happened. I was sitting right at the shower door. Everybody else was scared. When they asked Brody was so heavy. See, when they when we had shows, they uh didn't sing good paramedics. The paramedic was an old man and a overweight, I would say mother aged woman. Where when they put Brody on a girder, they couldn't lift him up. Because Brody at that time probably about 210, I mean about 315, 320, you know, six foot eight. So I went over and I pulled the girder up for them. Somebody, the, I remember the, the, the old man asking, "Can somebody help?" This is what every. I don't. If they told me they in the dressing room. If they tell you they were in that dressing room, this is what they did. The the man said, "Can somebody help us put him in in the ambulance?" Everybody in the dressing room did this. Hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Everybody. So if somebody got on your social, they were in the dressing room. Ask them why they didn't help. Yeah. Who else, Hello. Who, who else was in the dressing room? So apart from the locals, so I know Dutch well, was these there. Are people that, these are the people that I know for sure that was in the dressing room. Uh, Mark and Jay Youngblood. Nobody ever interviewed these guys. That's Rick Romero's son. Mm. I was drawing a picture of them when and uh, Brody walked over and he said, Wow, I didn't know you could draw like that. He said, I have drawings done on my son, drawings done on my son, but they, they, he said they're character drawn with the big head and a little body. He said, can you do a picture of my son uh, for me? And I said, you got one with you? He said, yes, because we, you know, I have just left world class and I had, and I was blackballed by Vince, so, didn't know, you know, I was on the shit list for every promoter because of my attitude and my you know, I don't know if you know that I got a, I used to have a very bad temper. You know, I would fight and drop the hat. I got, you know, I, I would just lose it, you know, and, and, and getting that I don't give a shit mode. I, I, I'm, I'm controlling it a lot. You know, I have gotten control of, of, of my temperament. But anyway, make a long story short, he would, he reached in his pouch 
to pull out a picture. And Jose came came by and said, Brody, can I talk to you for favor? Real nice like. I mean, very nice like. Brody still was holding his bag because we had just walked in the door. He was still holding his bag in his hand. And he said, sure. Brody took one step in the shower. He took two steps in the shower. As soon as that sucker foot touched the ground, as soon as that foot touched the ground, this is what I hear. And I was within six feet of him. Uh, uh. The second time he hollered, the first time he hollered, I looked up. The second time he hollered, he bent over. I sprung from my seat because Jose raised the knife like this, and I saw the knife in his hand. I reached over with one arm and I wrapped it around Brody waist and I yanked him out of the shower. The knife came down and cut off Bobby's ponytail. Wow. Carlos Colon cut me off and ran in the shower and pushed Jose up against the wall and said, no, Jose, no, Jose. I took Brody, Brody looked me in the eyes and said, I'm hurt, brother. Don't let them, not him, then don't let them hurt me anymore. I laid him on the floor. I stood over him. Carlo tried to talk to him. I said, Carlo, if you come over here, I'm going to knock your fucking head off your shoulder. I'm going to rip your head off your throat and shit down your throat. Brody tagged my pants leg and tell me, let him talk. Carlos walked over to Brody. Carlos said, is there anything I can do for you? Brody said to Carlos Colon, take care of my family. The ambulance took about 45 minutes to come because it was at the beginning of the show. You understand? Mm -hmm. So when the ambulance guys got there, they asked another thing. They asked uh, would everybody like to go with him? I jumped up on everybody in the dress room once again. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. Play deaf, dumb, and blind. I jumped on the back of the van where there was a wrestler. His name was Hercules something. He had like a V-shape. His son wrestled too. I can't think of his last name, but was, his first name, they used to call him Hercules. I grabbed him and pulled, and pulled him on the elevator with me. He said, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. He said, I said, I own him. Oh, yeah, another guy, Roberto Soto was there. Roberto Soto was in the dress room. But Roberto was commute, helped me to talk to the uh, the ambulance driver. Yeah. Yeah, Roberto Soto uh, was there. Um, uh, I, I, them the three guys I know for sure was in the dress room. I seen them, you know, when, when the action was going. Because a lot of the guy, like Dutch was there, but I think Dutch walked out. So was Dutch in the heel dressing room at this time? Because he's always said that he just... He was in a baby face. Right. He was in a baby face. This guy was in a baby face. Yeah. Our, 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 our dress room. But but anyway, to, to make a long story short, I pulled him on the thing with me. He said, I don't want to give up. I said, all I want to do is to interpret for me. I can't speak Spanish. You know, yeah. and so he he went to the hospital with me. Now, what happened to him? A, a month later, he got shot in the back five times. Wow. Now, earlier that day, Brody worked out in the gym with me. Earlier that day, this is what Brody told me. He said because things didn't go good, me and Brody. In fact, you believe it or not, we made up that day. <laughs> but we got in a we yeah we got in a you can ask what was his name Earl 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 uh he was in world class uh he used to tag team with the thumper uh I don't know I don't know that one his name was Eric somebody Eric Eric Embry Embry that's him there you yeah go. yeah. Yeah, he told me to leave because they called the police on me because I wanted to fight Brody because I was tag team with the, the Dingo Warrior, which later became the Ultimate Warrior. Mm -hmm. We were tag team partners, and they stopped booking us. So the the Ultimate Warrior was getting ready to go to uh, uh, J uh, Japan, and Vince heard about it and heard about him. So Vince told him, say, if you give up your trip to Japan, I can bring you here. You can make more money. Well, I had no place to go. 
after doing the Black Atlas gimmick, you know, after George Scott left, he left Brody in charge. So I went to uh, 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 Puerto Rico. Carlos told me I could come there to work full time, and that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, this was going to be me. All I had left was Puerto Rico, you know. And so Brody came up to me, held out his hand, and said, "Look, I saw it, but what happened with you in Texas?" He said, "But it won't happen here." He said. There's going to be a lot of changes. These Brody words, he can't speak up, so I'm speaking for him. There are going to be a lot of changes. He said, what happened in Texas, I had nothing to do with. He said, I just did as I was told because Kurt Von Erk was in an accident and lost a foot. So he was coming back, and the Arctic Warrior was a muscle man. Tony Atlas a muscle man. All three of us got the same gimmick. That's why Abdul the Butcher and Kamada did not get along because they had the same gimmick. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 And, and, and so, anyway, he said, there's going to be a lot of changes here. He said, I waited. Now, you figure out what this means. I waited a long time to get down, to get here. He said, I waited a long time to get in here. That he, I know he wasn't talking about wrestling. He'd been going in Puerto Rico for a year. So the only thing I can think about, he bought into the company. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. And he said, I'm either going to get what I want or I'm going to beat the hell out of him. When I saw Dutch Mantel and Brody at the Tanamont sitting on the steps, I said, Brody, why are you here? Because I called Carlos earlier. I told him I'd be a little bit late. Because the guy from the muscle factory that owned the gym, he was going. He wanted to go to see me wrestle, and I told him, I said, "Hey, if you give me a ride to buy your mom, then you can get in free with me." He said, "It's okay. I bring my wife or girlfriend." I said, "Yes." So I saw when I when I left the beach, and 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 went upstairs to chain. Brody was sitting on the steps with uh, Dutch Mantel. So I said, "Brody, why are you still here?" He said. I'm waiting on Jose. I'm waiting on Jose. Jose was his ride. You understand? Right. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You want to ride with us? I said, I go, I go in and I let the guy know at the front there that if, if Jose comes, that you already gone with me. He said, okay. He said, you don't mind if I ride with you? I said, no, 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 brother. I don't mind. So when the, my ride came, the guy came, he was driving. His wife was sitting in the front seat, or girlfriend. She slid over to the center. Brody got in the front seat because he couldn't fit in the back, you know. <laughs> you couldn't put him in the back. We had to put him at the front. So he said, and me and Dutch sat in the back seat. And that was when the minute. When I walk in the dress room, Jose, uh, Carlos Colon, and there's a red-headed guy that was piled off the name Victor. I don't know what his, how to say his last name. There was two Victor. And one was Victor Jerico, but I thought Jerico was a young kid with the black hair. This guy had kind of reddish hair, kind of like Chicky Star. You know, he was light-skinned Puerto Rican guy. Mm -hmm. But they were sitting in a football huddle. And as soon as Brody walked through that door, all three people done this. Like they saw a ghost. Jose immediately got up and walked out of the dressing room. That's when I went and sat there and started doing the drawing. See, Brody, Jose was Brody ride. They rode together that week. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. And that's the truth. And I would swear, you know what I always wanted to do? Guess what I always wanted to do? Go on, tell me. I always want to tell that story on the Steve Walker show. Steve Walker. I don't know the Steve Walker show. You'll have to explain. Well, that. here in America, he used to be a policeman, and he used to be a, a bodyguard for. Uh, oh, was it Jerry, Jerry Springer. Springer? Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, he started Steve, with Jerry Steve Springer, Wilcox, but, but he do the Steve live Wilcox. detecting machine, and and the guy that do the live detecting is a, is one of the number one guys in the world. He do stuff for the FBI and everybody. I always want to get on that show, and everybody will talk about Brody. Get on that show and take a live detector test. Hey, Tony, can I ask uh, this? Something, a, a couple of things I want to clarify. You said that uh, I'll ask two questions. You can you can refer to them both. So you said that Bro, uh, Brody made two noises. Um, does does that mean he was stabbed twice? Yes, there was two eight inch cut. How I found out the doctor, 
I was going nuts. I scared the brother. I was 6'2", 285 pounds <laughs> with a 650 bench. And I was madder than a, a horn toad. I got angry. Like I said, I got this temper. Most guys would tell you that. Talking to me now, you wouldn't think so. I'm what you call it extremely. I'm either extremely nice or extremely the other way. There's no yeah. no mother to Tony Atlas. You, you ever met people like that? I mean, it all the way this way. Oh, there's nothing yeah. in between. Extremes. <laughs> just like Extremes. Here. Right. Yeah, it's just like. It's just like here. There's nothing in here either, you know. If I, you know, like Ern Laird say, if my IQ was one point less, I'd be a banana, you know. But but uh, in, anyway, there are. Um, what was that question? I, I went well, brain well, dead um, on it. Well, you, you've already sort of confirmed it, that he was stabbed twice. The other thing I want to clarify. Yeah, well, anyway, the doctor came out and said there was two eight-inch cut. One cut the intestines. The other one cut the liver. He said, we got... The, the it won under control. He said, "Your friend is stable. He's stable." That was a doctor telling me. Now, he said, "He said now he said I got to get back in there to take up to fix up the uh to fix the liver." He said, "But he's gonna be okay." He said, "He's gonna be okay." I said, "All oh, good." He said, "But I need you to leave." I said, "Right." I said, "No, I want to stay, my friend." He said, you got everybody afraid of you. Either your size, your temperament. He said, because I was getting mad. I wanted to know what's going on. I wanted, I almost went into the operating room. I came that close. That when the doctor saw me peeking through the window. So he couldn't do his operation because of me. So I said, well, I don't want to do something that caused Brody death. So I said, you sure he's okay? He said, yes, come back tomorrow. You can see your friend tomorrow. So I left. Now here's something that most people don't know. And then I hear your I hear the interview with uh, Sabio Vega. Yeah. Which confirmed what I said. He said that two minutes after I walked out the door, he was a guy that cleaned up what alternate or alternate guy. Mm -hmm. He cleaned up the operating room. He said two minutes after I left the hospital, two security guys, this is his word. Two security guys went in the operating room and told them to leave and stop working on the American. Really? So that tells me Brody was not killed. He didn't die from the knife room. They sent people, whoever was in behind it, sent people to the hospital to finish the job. Hmm. Can he said two security people came into the, right after I left. So evidently, they were watching me. Mm. They left Brody at the hotel. The incident supposed to, and my man, could be wrong, it's supposed to happen. Why would you leave a, a person like Bruiser Brody at the hotel? Why would two security guards wait for me to leave to go into the hospital? Mm. Then when I get back, there was a policeman that left weight. He said, Tony, I was going to talk to you later at the hotel. I got everybody. He said, I got everybody's statement. Everybody's statement. That's what he said, not me. I don't have yours. I said, well, I give you yours. He said, did you see what happened? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, what happened? I said, excuse my language. I said, that motherfucker right there stabbed him. The police said, you mean Vader? I said, yeah, that motherfucker right there stabbed him. I said, ask anybody in the dressing room. He said, I did. He said, everybody in the dressing room said a wrestling fan did it. And he was brag he was stabbed, he was stabbed when he came in the dressing room. Mm. You talk to Barbara Goodish. Talk to Barbara Goodish. She would tell you, she went to the police station. The police, this is what Barbara Goodish told me now, Brody's wife. She got no reason to lie to me. She said only one American came down to to tell what happened. One. One. Mm -hmm. came, went to the police station. Anybody else say they went to the police station? They lied. They lied. I would tell them to face the land because I was there. 
you've you've heard the, the only reason I went to the police station is because Seeker, who is the father of Roma Rain, went with me as my bodyguard. Seeker stuck with me the whole time to protect me. Nobody. The reason I got out of Puerto Rico is because of Seeker. I got no reason to lie. You understand? Yeah. A lot of guys want to jump in on stuff because it's popular to make themselves popular. They were they, they nobody helped him. Brody had one friend. One. Ask Baba Goodish. Mm -hmm. One. You you know uh, you know Rick Flair once claimed that he was in the locker room that day. Which has since proved that he wasn't. That, I don't know why he would say something like, "You could look at the records of where he was booked that day." I know. Come on now, there, there, there's wrestling cars out there. You could look at the car for Buy Your Moon. Why would Rick Flair there would have got Brody and Abdullah and the Sheik? Exactly. Why would Why would they book Rick Flair there? When they got all them top names, the Iron Sheik. The Wilds are the Alpha some more. Bruiser Brody, for God's sake. Abdullah the Butcher was there. You know? Mm -hmm. The Iron Sheep was there. Flair was nowhere there. I never seen Flair in Puerto Rico. I went there a lot. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't work that little bit of ass territory at his time. They first call him not pay. <laughs> the only way Flair would be there if Vince booked him. <laughs> you know what Carlos paid? You think Rick Flair gonna work for three hundred bucks a match? Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, as with Flair, as in what was his payday? Oh, he'd, he probably, he'd probably say 30000 or something like that, I'm sure. From Carlos Cologne? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Don't hold your breath, brother. Come on. <laughs> See, sometimes guys would say things because they think you guys marks. They think y'all too stupid to look it up. Look it up. Mm -hmm. He was not there. I'm I a, never in my life saw saw Flair in Puerto Rico. Never in my life. And I went there a lot. I, I was a tag team champion. I am going to move on, Tony. And there was something, yes, sir. something yeah. before. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry, Tony. I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask this because you wanted to bring this up uh, before we started. And you said you wanted to set something straight. So as you know, I've got a podcast with Dutch Mantel, Storytime with Dutch Mantel. And uh, he said, or actually I told the story that uh, in your early days to promote you being in a town yeah. they would put you on the back of a truck you'd hit the pose and then you know basically one like, guy like, yeah, like yeah, his name was charlie his name was charlie and he, and he, and he, and he was shreveport louisiana mm -hmm. shreveport louisiana his name was charlie i don't know his last name it was an italian guy and he was a promoter and, and he took me through town as i coach so the people could see me i flex and and that ain't the only time in fact if I didn't know I was doing this interview with you, I said, when I ever beat this guy, I got to see him a picture of me doing it. I got pictures of me doing it. Oh, really? When I was in Africa, we done it in Africa. I just, uh, see, they used to put us in the parades. It's a parade. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you get in the parade, they put the wrestlers in a truck. I did it, as Larry Zabisco, me and him did it in Tennessee. Same thing. In Tennessee, me and Larry Zabisco, the, the guy named was Jeff uh, uh, Tankerberry, something like that. He used to he used to promote uh, in Tennessee, and me and Larry Zabisco worked for and was in the parade. And Larry loved this story because what happened was all the kids had water guns. So I stopped. <laughs> I stopped and got me a little small water gun. And so I said, if they squirt me this year, I'm going to squirt them back. <laughs> so the kid was squirt, squirting up with the water gun, right? So I pulled out my water gun, and I squirt a little kid. Well, when I squirt that little kid, these other kids came out with the, you ever see the big pump water gun? And they started squirting my ass. <laughs> Larry Zabisco <laughs> fell out of the chair laughing. He said, look at that idiot. He said, no, not to squirt them kid. So I had every kid in the parade squirting my ass. I was so, it looked like I just got swimming in Niagara Falls when I got through. <laughs> and that was with, with Sabisco. Another time I did the same thing uh, was two weeks ago. You don't believe me? Ask Jimmy Hart, ask uh, Bob Orton Jr., but they did it with me. It's not unusual. Mm. 
This, see, these old promoters, they put, they have certain ways of doing things because they didn't have the internet like they did now. No, but it's Most like you, people didn't it's have... Like you're a right. bill, it's like you're a billboard. Uh, it's like you're a moving billboard at the time, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why even now they do it. Everywhere I go, they give you a T-shirt. The T-shirt on the front, got their business on the back. They stand doing it. Mm -hmm. they, they turn us humans into human billboard even right now today I mean if you buy uh, go to any place they got the t-shirt with the with the advertisement on it mm -hmm. so you get a t and I get a, I got a lot of t-shirts for people want to advertise their product because they know people are going to look at me because I'm, I'm, I'm not an average looking guy they're going to look at me anyway so I'm like and, and it's, it's nothing uh, I think Dutch took it wrong that he would think they did it because I was black. My color had nothing to do with it. Okay. They do it with white guys too. Yeah, if he, he had a he'd never heard of it. He, back them days, he, he thought it was like a carnival thing from the thirties. So he was like, "No way they would have done it in the seventies. But no, I heard. I actually heard the story from an old yes, interview that you said. Yes, he did. Yeah. In the seventies, they just did it in two thousand and we just did it in two thousand twenty-three. For God's sake, come on. <laughs> hey, Tony. And Bob Orton, he was he was on the float with me. <laughs> I do it in Maine all the time. They they have uh they, they have this these festivals and they put put me on on the boat. We, I told you I just did it two weeks ago for mm. God's sake. <laughs> I don't know. Dutch need to get out the house more. <laughs> Tony, I've got I've got a game for you, but I'm just going to pause the recording one second. Okay, and we're back. And Tony, I'm going to play a little game with you. I call it name association. I'm going to read you a sentence, a description, and you just tell me the uh, first name that pops into your head when I tell you this description. So the first one is going to be the last man standing at the bar. Andre the Jank. That's a name I've heard quite a few times. I'll move on. Um, well, I mean, come on, that's an easy I know, one. Yeah, that is an easy one. That is an easy <laughs> one. Ask me, ask me who the biggest guy. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> who I'll the get... hell? Who the hell can drink that many beers? <laughs> Without <laughs> killing yourself. <laughs> that's the easy question. <laughs> Go on. I've got, I've, got an, I've got a tough one for you then. The most beautiful woman wrestler or valet in real life. Well, that's a toughie. So many of them. Uh, you've you've got one. You've got one forever. Uh, oh shoot! Wow. Well, that's a toughie. Shall I? Shall I come back to it? Yeah, come back. To okay, that we'll, that, we'll do. That, it. That, that's tough. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is that is tough. Uh, the mo but if I should guess one, I can't think of a name right now, but. Uh, she would. What was her name? Ah, uh, Trish Stratus. Trish Stratus. There you go. That's a good one. I, yeah, her. Uh, it, my, from from what I see. Yeah, I, I would say she was the most beautiful in real life. Yeah, yeah. Without the makeup, you know. With, with, when I when you see her, she didn't need makeup. Mm. The other one, a lot of them, they did. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, the biggest bully. Oh, uh, that's tough for me anyway because most of them were scared of me. Oh, uh, Vader. Vader. We we Vader, get yeah. we get that name. The Vader. Yeah. The smelliest wrestler. Oh, that's easy. Randy Savage. What? Really? I've never had that name before. Why? Macho Man Randy Savage. Yeah. Why Macho? Why Macho Man? What did he smell of? He was cheap. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't want to buy detergent. Let me tell you a random savage story. <laughs> and, and God rest him. I, I love this brother Lennon. Me and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, we was going somewhere to a Chinese restaurant that was right up down right beside the hotel. And uh Randy Savage was coming in with Elizabeth. Steamboat turned to him, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat turned to him and said, Randy. There's a nice Chinese restaurant down the street. Would you like to go with us? Randy said, no, I got some leftover pizza from last night. Randy only spent money on ring gear. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't spend money on other stuff. So he would, he would go the whole week 
without washing his clothes. I opened the door one time with, because him and Elizabeth had a separate dressing room. So somebody told me to go and get Randy, one of the, the office people. So I went and opened the door to tell Randy that they won, and the smell come rushing out of there and nearly knocked me down. Wow. Yeah, that, because he would never wash his wrestling gear because he'd wait till he got home to use his machine. Because it cost <laughs> ah, that's how cheap he was. He was tighter. He was tighter than an ass stretch over a bass drum. <laughs> yeah, the most smelly was Monster Man Randy Savage, that's, believe it or not. That's just a poffo territory, though, wasn't it? It's a, a trait. Sorry, not Lenny. Because Lanny, I thought Lanny was really cheap well, as well as the dad. Raised him like that. When I first met Lenny, Lenny and Randy, it, it was in... Uh, uh, New Mexico, Albuquerque. Is that what you call it? Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. And they, yeah. And, and, and they was wrestling, and their father was wrestling, uh, Angelo. I wrestled against his father, uh, Angelo Poffo. Mm -hmm. And my match that night in Albuquerque, New Mexico was against, uh, uh, Leaping Lenny Poffo, what he used to wrestle at. And he would double join it. He would do all these flips and all this stuff and before he became the, 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 uh, before he became the, uh, the genius. Uh, yeah, the junior, he was the, uh, uh, called uh, 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 Leaping Lenny Poffer. Mm -hmm. And I wrestled Leaping Lenny Poffer. The first time I wrestled Randy Savage, he was tag team with uh, Steve Strong, with Steve Strong, a uh, tag team partner in Mid Atlantic. That's when I, the first time I wrestled against Randy Savage. Okay, uh, this next one is the stiffest or most reckless wrestler you ever faced. Where the stiffness was a lot. Reckless, uh, the War Warriors. Oh, really? The War Warriors were, were the most reckless. And there was another guy I never worked with, but uh, he, I hear stories, and that was the guy that feed me more, feed me more. Right back. He was, I hear he was very reckless. Mm. But the War Warrior, in fact, there's a tape of me and uh, Jim Bonzel where I'm wrestling against Anima and Hawk, and me and Hawk got into a little bit of a shoot. Oh, really? Yeah, because I told him, I said, brother, I'm going to work with you the way you work with me. I said, if you get stiff with me, I'm going to get stiff with you. You want to fight me, I'm going to fight you. And then Anima got in, and we have Anima kind of say, Are you okay, brother? I said, yeah. And I said, but your, your partner there, I, I, I said, you, you, know, uh, you, you know, I'm not like these other guys. I said, I can handle myself out here. But, uh, uh, yeah, because they would, when they first started, they would just throw guys any type of way. Now, reckless to yourself, Nick Foley. Yes. And Adrian Adonis. <laughs> to themselves, not to the, the opponent. But Nick Foley didn't care how he fall. And another guy was like that, too, uh, uh, didn't care how he fall, was Adrian Adonis. Mm. Now, Adrian Adonis was the most disgusted individual I've met in my life. The most disrespectful, most disgusted human being I ever met in my life was Adrian O'Donnell. Did you, um, well, uh, tell me more about why, and also were you there for the in-ring fight with Danny Spivey? He would blow snot everywhere. Oh. He would take and, and put feces on 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 the wall. And he was just nasty. And, and then, we, and then we, he, he would sit at a table and eat and spit food across the table. He did everything discussed he would bend over and spread his the cheeks of his butt and stick a cucumber up his rear end and oh he would oh he would he would oh he'd make you vomit <laughs> he would make you vomit even when they put a game game the uh the game the the gay gimmick you know he didn't even want to put the makeup on right I mean he you know he was just disgusting yeah were you, were you there for the fight between he and Danny Spivey no, but I heard about it. I I, I wasn't there, so I, I can't speak on. No. But I, I just heard about it. So anything I say, just be her say. See, with me, if I didn't see it, I'm not going to talk about it because no. I wasn't there. Okay, I've got another one for you, and bear with me. The best and worst WWF road agents. The worst. George the Animal Steel, the best. It's a tie between 
Chief J. Strongbow and uh, Bit Fiddler. What, I'm going to go with Chief first. So people either loved him or hate him. So why was Chief the best for you? He was always honest with me. He warned me about things. He tried to look after me, mm -hmm. you know, and he would tell me stuff uh, to to uh, 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 to try to keep me out of trouble. But I was so thick-headed, so wound up, you know. I was on the steroid. I was smoking pot and smoking cocaine. So I was at that mood where I couldn't listen to nobody. S.D. Jones tried to get me. You know, here's the funny thing. You know I never paid for drugs. It's because you're famous, that's why. No, I got it from the wrestlers. Oh, really? Chief told me that. Chief said they do that, Tony, because they want you to get fired so they can take your place. Uh -huh. They would come to me and give me drugs. It used to piss SD off rawly because SD was hoping that I'd not do it because he was my tag team partner. So SD knew the only reason he had a job was because of me. So SD would look at me because that's why I chose. I had two people to put me in the Hall of Fame, SD Jones and George Scott. George Scott, because he the one that got me started, gave me a mentor, and SD, because he was, at that time, he was my only friend I ever had in this business was SD Jones. I had no friends. Mm -hmm. SD was the only friend that I had in this business at that time. Now I got more like Tito Santana, it's a great friend. Tommy Rich is like a brother to me. I love mm -hmm. Tommy Rich to death, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that guy's like, a, me. we're not friends, we brothers, Tommy Wildfire Rich. I mean, I, I just love that guy to death. In fact, me here with tag team partners last night. Yeah, I was going to say you're with him today. Yeah, here aren't in you? West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, we just wrestled. Yeah, you get <laughs> get uh, Chris and say you know, a, a match of us. We just did a match last night. But yeah, our chief would come to me and tell me, "See what guy? See, I had a four percent body fat, and I wasn't that heavy on drugs like people make out to be. I I would smoke at that time. We just call it free basin." But now y'all call it crack. They gave it a name now. Where, where, where you cook it up. You know, it's mm -hmm. cocaine, but you just it just cook cocaine. So I would get extremely dehydrated and get muscle cramps. So I had to take a day off from work the next day to get, cause I, you know, to dehydrate my body. Mm -hmm. so I would make an excuse not to be at the show. Every time I got high, the next day I didn't show up. So the guy would go tell Vince, oh, he's out getting high somewhere. No. I got a very low tolerance to drugs, but I never did them. The first time I put any drugs in my body, I was almost 30 years old. I didn't do drugs when I was a teenager. I didn't do drugs in Georgia. I didn't do drugs when I won the Mr. USA. How the hell are you going to do cocaine and win a Mr. USA title? <laughs> How the hell are you going to do drugs and, 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 and be state champion in powerlifting? You're not going <laughs> to do it. I don't care who tell you that. Only an idiot would believe that. So I had my body to take care of. So they, I would get high with the guys to be one of the boys. They would get up. And go to work the next day because their body was immune to it. Because they would, they bother you to. Man's was not. Me and Tommy was laughing the other last night. Just last night, I would take two puffs off of the marijuana stick. Right? I'm so messed up. I don't know where I'm at. Two puffs. <laughs> These guys, I roll with Jake the Snake Robert. He smoked one, then smoked another one, smoked another one. Get in the ring and wrestle. <laughs> Me, I don't know where the hell I'm at. <laughs> From two pump, I got a very anybody that know me, ever been with me, would tell you Tony got a very it don't take much. Just like with beer. One uh two 12 ounce beers, I'm drunk. I got a very low tolerance to drugs and alcohol. So a little bit to me do more damage than other guys because because I had a very low uh, body fat. See, when you got a high body fat, you know, you got something to absorb it. Mm -hmm. I had nothing to absorb that stuff. Before um, before I forget, why was George the Animal Steel the worst? Uh, Road A. Because he was a backstabber. He was smiling guys facing it because they were one of the boys, they trust him. But but he stews guys out, he would cut guys and, 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 and he would cost guys their job. You know, he was a backstabber. You know, George would just the rotten son of a bitch. Yeah.
Who did you, I mean? Do you know anyone's job that he cost? In your opinion, man, for one, because I, they wanted me to put over Hercules Hernandez, and Vince pulled me in, the, and, and I. <laughs> there was in uh, what's the name of that town in New York? Uh, where he would just do TV at uh, Albany, Poughkeepsie. Oh, Poughkeepsie, sorry, Poughkeepsie. We was in Poughkeepsie, New York, and uh. The old timer told me you could do a job in the arena because only the people in the arena will see it. Mm -hmm. But don't do a job on TV because then everybody sees it. So they were doing TV, and Hercules and Anna was managed by Slick at that time. So they wanted me to put over Hercules. I agreed to it at first. But then I went back to dress myself and thinking about it. I said, this is TV. I'm not going to do it. So I got dressed. And I, I rode with SD Joe. I went and sat in the car. So there was time for the match. Vince said, Where's Tony? SD <laughs> said, He's in the car. So Vince came out in the parking lot, Vince Jr., not senior Jr., to talk to me. He said, Tony, I, uh, you know, this is good. I'm going to do an anger with you and uh, Hercules down the road. What great match that going to be? Hercules versus the Mighty Atlas. It's going to be great. And besides, you're going to get screwed anyway. He's not going to beat you. I'm going to have Slick to take the king, and you're going to pick him up for the press slam, and he's going to pull your legs from under you. And then we're going to go all over and make money with this. Come on, Tony. Let's go make this money. I said, oh, okay. So I go in, and uh, uh, I go to uh, go in. I get dressed, and then Vince came back again while I was in the dress room. He said, come talk to me, Tony. And he started telling me all the things he wanted to do with me, you know, and uh, everything. And uh, I said, okay. So I go go out to do my do my uh, to put over Hercules. <clears throat> George fell on his face when I opened the door. He was listening through the keyhole. <laughs> as soon as I saw George, I looked at Vince. Vince looked at me, and I knew then that now Vince can't do it. See, when Vince talked to you, he had to stay with you. Mm -hmm. Because if, if Vince gives in to you and the other boys know about it, they would try the same thing. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. So what, what in between you and Vince have to stay between you and Vince in order for it to work? Because then the other wrestler would see what you did to get ahead. Like, to understand the rest, not the entertainment business, the wrestling business, it's a dog-eat-dog dog world, and you have to get your bite out of it. Mm -hmm. If you finish the wrestling business and you have one friend, consider yourself lucky. Chief Thornbow said, Tony, remember this. They are not your friends. They are your business associates. They are not your friends. They are your business associates. Mm -hmm. Why do you think Mean Gene had a funeral and nobody shows up? There's nothing in it for them. Mm -hmm. Why is everybody talking about Brody? They're doing it for the paycheck. Even if they wasn't there. Somebody said, I'll pay you to do an interview. Yeah, what do you want to talk about? Well, let's talk about uh, life in Africa. Oh, I've been there all the time. <laughs> 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 Where you live at? I live in Dublin, Ireland, but I go to Africa all the time. <laughs> With, uh, let me if, a story, if a story is worth telling, it's worth embellishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what, and that's what the, but I don't do that because my life, just my life, I don't need to embellish. I was going to say, it's, because interest, because it's interesting I'm a, enough. Yeah, I'm a, uh -huh. It's interesting enough. Without having to embellish, I don't need to add nothing to it. I mean, every day I, I go through. It. I mean, I, I live, I live during segregation. Mm -hmm. I live through the civil rights movements. I live through uh, homelessness. I live as a rich superstar. I have lived. You know, just my life itself is interesting enough. I don't need to, you know, you know, to exaggerate anything but it sounds like a lot because i guys like me and brody and andre we live more life than the average wrestler because we were 
we went from territory to territory to territory to territory. I worked every territory in in the world. You can't name a territory I never worked for because of my physique, like Andre, because of his size, everybody wanted to use him. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, a, at that time, a novelty in wrestling. Now, everybody got that body. But back in my day, it was just me, Rocket Johnson, uh, Alvin Puskin. There were maybe, what, what, 10 of us in the wrestling business to have that, maybe 10 people. Yeah. You know, now, that, that, that you know, it, it don't mean nothing. Everybody got a great physique now. But during that time, it wasn't. You didn't... You, I was I would say that me and Earl Maynor, Earl Maynor was the name, and myself was the only competitive bodybuilder at that time in wrestling. Most of them never competed in a competition. Mm -hmm. I competed in competition. I was a, a competitor. I'm uh, I'm gonna give you three more and then we'll get to as many fan questions as we can and then I will thank you for your time. Um the worst... I like to talk, huh? Hey, oh, dude, I like to hear. I like to listen. We like the stories, man, absolutely. Uh, I want to ask you this. The worst injury that you ever saw in the ring? Uh. I can ask it another way. What's the worst injury oh. that you ever suffered? Oh, with, with Shawn Michael and Marty Jannetty, I hurt that, hurt that kid. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I was there. And I remember Vince said, get him out of the damn ring. He's holding up the show. <laughs> you kidding. Vince said, get him out of the ring. He's holding up the show. Yeah. Uh, I, I was there with Marty Genetic. When they did stuff, they, there was some move they did, and they hurt that kid real bad. Yeah, was he called Chuck Austin or Charles Austin yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I was there when that, that happened. I'm trying to think of another one. What's the worst injury that you ever suffered, and how did it happen? Well... I dislocated uh, my knee wrestling against the Freebird, me and Tommy Rich in uh, 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 in Georgia. Uh, that and I had to wrestle the, the next day. They come into the room with a, a needle about this long. Gene Anderson held my hand. He said, "We're gonna fix." I couldn't walk. Tommy Rich and them had to go to my the room and carry me to the match because I have dislocated my knee so bad and. Uh, they shot me with this big needle with a chromosome or what you call it. Mm -hmm. And me and Harley Race, the next day after I hurt my knee, we wrestled, we wrestled for one hour. Wow. Seeing them, they I broke my hand. And and uh and I had to wrestle Ken Patero for the Midland title. And I never missed a miss a, a, a match. That when I had a cask on. If you know if you look at that match when I beat Patero, I got a cask on my arm. I hit him with the cask. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, and then I, I broke my neck in that car accident I told you about uh, with Tommy Rich, mm -hmm. and uh, and, and I and, and I still had to wrestle with a uh, with a broken neck. So, so I took actually, a war so, thing around my neck. So yeah, what was the actual yeah. injury then? Was it a a small fracture? Well, or? what it is, you know, you got these uh, what you call it things that stick out like this. Uh, yeah, was broke. Two of them were broke. The, 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 the centerpiece didn't break because my neck muscle was so thick at that time that it hells it. But he said, if I didn't have the neck I had, but if you look at old grandpa now, that ain't too bad in a kid. <laughs> look at that. No wrinkles. Look at that thing. You know? Because I still train my neck. I still do bridges and stuff. Mm. And that's why if you look at me, you don't see like Ric Flair with the turkey neck. Yeah, I don't have none of that. You notice that, right? Oh yeah, I know it's it. I know it's yeah. it. Uh, we're gonna move on. Biggest ribber or best ribber, brother? Is only one, Mister Fuji. Yes, Mister Fuji. Fuji put a rib on me one time. He said, "Tony, my wife make good cookies." You want one of Fuji cookies? I said, yes, I would love a cookie. He gave me cookie. Everything turned to four and five and six. One person became two. <laughs> and I had to wrestle. And he would do it right before your match. You, I went to go to the ring. I go into the shower. 
They said, no, Tony, the ring is down the way. I couldn't find my way to the ring. <laughs> and he thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I was driving down the street with uh, uh, a junkyard dog, and Mike Watonga is sitting in the back of the, of, the, of the car. And I said, dog, where all these trucks come from? What trucks? I said, all these 18-wheeler. What are you talking about? I said, look at all these trucks out here. Dog said, pull over. Pull over. Pull the fuck over right now. Pull over. Pull over. <laughs> He's scared to death. I said, what the hell is wrong with J.Y.? I thought he was high or something. So I pull over. Dog said, how many trucks do you see? I said, oh, about five or six. He said, Tony, there's only one truck. <laughs> Michael Tonda was sitting in the back, and he said, well, it's a good thing you didn't try to pass one of them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's a good thing you didn't try to pass one on. <laughs> Everything went in. Yeah. yeah. Because I got a, such a low <laughs> tolerance to to drugs that I would it would affect me different. I, I'm like that now. The, the buddy just asked me, he said, Tony, do you, do you still smoke or something? I said, yeah, I may take a puff or two, you know, about once a week or once or twice a week. He said, one puff? I said, yeah, because that's all that's I need. need. <laughs> the way these guys would push more on me. Come on, come on, got me one of the boys. Come on. And then they would leave me in the room, and they walking around. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know where the hell I'm at. Yeah, I got a very low tolerance to drugs. That's why we steroids. You know what I use for steroids? Go on. Diana balls. Are they the pills? Yes. Yeah. That's what I did. I took three a day for six weeks, and then I would stop for 12 weeks. Mm. See, this is the reason why. When I first started, the doctor told me this. When you take, let's say you take steroid in September, for the month of September, every day in September. Well, it takes one month for it to clear your system. So even though you took it for one month, you are actually on the juice for two months. Well, me being a personal trainer, your body only produce what it needs. So when you take an artificial uh, uh, st uh, stimulant like steroids or testosterone, your natural testosterone is not producing. You understand? Mm -hmm. The body only produce what it needs. So if you take it artificially, your system throws shits down. So now you have to lay off twice the amount of time that you was on. So if you were taking it for, if you was on for two months, really you took it for one month, but it take a month for you to clear. So actually you're on for two months. You have to lay, the next two months, you have to lay off for four months before you do it again. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I've got a I've got a question for you relating to steroids. Now, uh, this was going to be further on, but uh, you were in the WWF in the very early 90s as well as quite a few years in the 80s. And obviously in 94, Vince McMahon goes to uh, federal courts. He's on trial for distributing sp steroids to the boys. And one of the cruxes of the argument is that Vince McMahon, it was alleged was basically telling people to get onto steroids and other, and he said no, he was found not guilty. Did Vince McMahon ever say to you, I mean, obviously you had a great body, so he probably didn't, but uh, did you ever hear him tell other people, get on the steroids if you want to spot anything that overt? Well, he didn't have to do it verbally. <clears throat> See, them guys didn't want to blame Vince for their own decision. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Vince never told anybody to do anything. They would say, make comments. Now, I'm going to tell you, just to give you an example, mm -hmm. so you understand what I'm saying. I was at the billing when that that guy got slapped by Dr. D. David Shaw. Yeah, John Stossel. Uh, Stossel, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was there. I I almost done that. <laughs> you know that? No. I almost, yeah, I almost, and the guy that saved my baker was S.D. Jones. Biz come in the dressing room. And he said, we got this guy walking around asking people if it's wrestling fake. It would be nice if somebody would take care of him. Ah. And then he walks out. That's how they do it. Say, I wish I had more guys with that type of body. You know, mm -hmm. the only 
guy that I know that told someone to do something, it, it was Tito Santana and Jim Barnett. Me and Tommy Rich, we get high and we go in the ring and go wild. Jim Barnett went to Tito Santana and said these words. Tito, you should do drugs like Tommy Rich and Tony Atlas so you go in the ring and go wild. They would make suggestions. Uh huh. They wouldn't actually, they're not stupid enough to actually tell you. They would hint towards it. So a lot, everybody, like I say, wrestling is an individual sport. So if I could increase my body in order to make more money, become a big WWF superstar, I would do it. So he didn't actually have to come out and say, hey, you should get on the juice. He, no, that they don't, none of them do it that way. You can see who's on top. And that's yes. Trump do the same thing. He don't actually tell you. They would hint towards it. So most people that they would think, hey, if I do this, I'd be in good grace. So David Shook figure that if he done that, he will be because he wanted to get another match with Hogan. He tried everything to get another match with Hogan. See, everybody wanted to work with Hogan at that time because you work with Hogan, you got a big paycheck. Everybody mm -hmm. want to be on Hogan call because you got a big. See, the guys used to get in the day, they didn't have they didn't have contracts. You got paid by the percentage of the door. You, you understand? Yeah, yeah. You like Rick Flair used to get 8% of the door. So, you know, guy would get a certain percentage according mm -hmm. to where you are on the car. Yeah. So the higher you are on the car, the bigger your 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 payday were, the lower you was on the car, the lower your 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 payday. But they had a guarantee, like a limit that they were. You know, you would get the guarantee no matter how what the house was. You had a most guys had a guarantee that they would guarantee this amount of money. But if the house was good, you could you know you know a three hundred dollars a night guarantee could turn into a fifteen hundred dollar uh, payday or twenty five hundred dollar or five thousand dollar payday, mm -hmm. depending on the on the house because they because they worked off that. That's why when Dust Mantel took and left the. Uh, the building when the Brody stabbed it, called Dutch would go, he knew how many seats was in the arena. So he wouldn't count the people in the seat. He would count the seats that was empty. Ah. And then deducted from like let's say you got this building hold twenty thousand uh uh twenty thousand people. So you look up and you see maybe five to a thousand seats empty. So you just deduct, you know. You, you, and you could get a, a, not an accurate account, but you know that there, if, if you hold 20, then there's about anywhere between 18 to 19,000 people in this building, according to the empty seats. Mm -hmm. And that's how they used to tell what the house was by counting the empty seats. And Dust would do that. Rick Flair was real good at it. He was so good at it, he could almost get it down to the exact number. He didn't miss it. He maybe a couple of numbers. But a lot of guys would do that. That'll because they got a percentage of the door, and they and they, that way you couldn't screw the the promoter can't screw them because they say, "Hey, Vince, come on, you know." And then once the guy would mention, the it's eighteen thousand people here tonight. Then Vince said, "Well, you know, it's eighteen fifty, but that's <laughs> close enough. He he he's old, so I better pay him his percentage." Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to give you one more, then I'm just going to ask fan questions until our time is up. And I want to know the most memorable backstage fight. Uh, not including like Brody or anything terribly serious like that, but the most memorable backstage fight that you saw. Oh, I'm going to give you two. Oh, do it. This one you're going to love. Now you got to screw the expression now, okay? But I have to tell it like I see it and tell it like one at a time. Okay. Thunderbolt Powders over there, mid soft wrestling. <laughs> we were working for uh, 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 Bill Watts. And Thunderbolt was working with a guy called Tank Patton. And Tank came, Thunderbolt went ahead and met. Of course, Thunderbolt won. Tank Patton came back, wanted to fight uh, Thunderbolt. And these are Tank Patton were that fucking. Every time I did everything for him, I sold all his goofy shit. I sold everything for him. I flopped all the ring. He didn't sell nothing. He made me look like a piece of shit. He said, I'm going to whoop his ass. And then Bill said, Bill said, okay, y'all fight. But after the fight, I don't want to hear no more of it. They, Thunderbolt was getting ready to take a shower. He had his uh, a towel wrapped around it. And then it flip-flops. 
So they got a fighting. I didn't know about Bill at that time. Me and Dusty Rose. So I broke, went, and I pulled him apart the first time. Me and Dusty Rose. Bill said, Dusty, Tony, if y'all don't let a fight, I'm going to fire the both of you. Me got mad at Dusty because Dusty knocked over my Diana balls and was stepping <laughs> on my pill. So now I want to fight Dusty because he, he don't knocked over my bottle of, you know, of, of Diana ball. So they got, they went back to fighting. Thunderbolt knocked Pat, uh, got on top of, uh, uh, tank Patton and started beating him. And finally, we figured Tank had enough. Thunderbolt, who turned religion for some reason, pulled out his Bible and started reading scripture to Tank while he was knocked out. <laughs> Another fight was Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, and Matt Bourne over some girl. Right. Yeah, there was some girl that they both were dating or something, and one slapped the girl or did something, and they got in a fight, and Ernie Ladd, Ernie the Cat Ladd knew he had bad knees, right? He's going to break up the fight. He was a booker for a bill, and he got in between them and did this. But you ever saw the, the Wizard of uh, Bob where they throw the water on the witch? Yes, yes. And she yeah, started yeah. sinking? Ernie started sinking. But his knees were giving out on it. So, and then Ernie looked at me, on the Atlas, Tony Atlas, come here, Tony Atlas. Break these two up. I can't hold them no longer. Come on, Tony Atlas, break them up. And he started here, and every time he spoke, he just he was down on his knees when I went to break them up. And, uh, <laughs> it was a good thing I did because Hacksaw got Matt Bourne in a headlock, and he had his his finger in his eye, he was going to pull his eye out. Wow. And I grabbed Hacksaw's hand and pulled Hacksaw back to keep him from taking Matt Bourne eye. And then Ernie said, now this can't go out of this judgment because Bill would fire all of us. That was one of the fights uh, that I witnessed. Another one, uh, Mr. Wrestling, number two, and uh, this guy that wore dressed like the sheep. Uh, Scandal Rackbar? Right Agbar. Is it Scandal or Agbar? Yeah. Yeah, Scandal and Agbar. And he take his t thing off his head, swing it around like that, where the corner hit two in the eye. With rest, hit, but he didn't apologize for it. So he kept swinging the thing. So two got mad, not because he got hit in the eye, because the guy didn't have the courtesy to come over and say, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. He didn't apologize. So they got an argument in the back. So Ole Anderson Say, let them fight. So they got in the fight, and two still had a mask on. So when the fight was over, two had these knots on his head, sticking out through the mat. And Ole Anderson <laughs> was had to be there. Ole said, hey, you raised all that hell about getting flickering eyes with a little towel. Now look at you. You got knots over the head. So Ole started picking on Rassett, teasing Rassett, too, about because when he put his mask on, there were knocks, you know, <laughs> all over it, all, all over his head. But uh, I'm not trying to brag on myself none, but most of the guys were really scared of me. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like Brad Blair told a lie one time about the fight with me and uh uh Paul uh Ondo. It was not a fight. I Paul Ondo was riding with somebody, him and, and Bram Blair. They was riding with somebody. They left them at the building. Me and Tom and Rich were riding together. They left them at the building. They was healed. They wouldn't even throw being in the car with us anyway. Mm -hmm. But we were going to give them a ride from Dayton, Ohio, to Columbus, Ohio. So they, we pulled around the corner. They jumped in the back seat. So Paul, as soon as he got in the car, he said, what is that fucking smell? I said, that my barbecue rib. Because me and Tom, we stopped at this barbecue place. Because most times we get up, the, the match at the they started at 8. They was over by 10. So most of the, at 10 o'clock, most of the good food places were closed. And the only place to get food was like 7-Eleven, you know, a hot dog, dog, slice of pizza or something. I couldn't eat that junk. Mm -hmm. So I got me some barbecue ribs, and, and uh, I had me a, 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 a tomato and a cucumber that I was going to cut up and make myself a salad, you know. I used to carry my own special made salad dressing with me, and I ate meat and veggies. That's all I ate. That's why I come. I looked like I wouldn't eat, like, 
pasta or bread. You know, I ate fruit, veggie, and meat. That, that was my whole diet. Mm -hmm. So Paul said, I'm going to throw it out the window. Well, I'm just going to joke with Paul. I didn't know he was in a piss poor mood. So I said, if you throw my my ribs out, it's good in them ribs out, I'm going to throw you out with them. Paul said, you think you can throw me out? I said, yeah, I'll throw you out, Paul. And I thought, you know, I'm a good human. And I wasn't even thinking about fighting nobody. So he kept hitting the back of the seat. Pull over. Pull the fuck over. Pull the fuck over. So Tommy Rich found it. Pull over. Paul jumped out of the back seat, ran around to the passenger door. I opened my door. Paul tried to sucker punch me. I was an amateur wrestler. So I was double leg diving. I don't know if you know what this movie is called, A Crater. Mm -hmm. What I do, I'm on, let's say I'm on the right side of you. I put my arm behind you, the back of your head. I reach over, I grab your left leg, and I pull your left leg up to where I could lock it in like this. Yeah. And then I take my legs and wrap it around your right leg. It's called A Crater in Amateur Wrestling. It's a, it, all amateur wrestlers know this move. And I held Paul there until he cooled off. And then Fanny Thomas said, okay, guy, that's enough. That's enough. He, We broke us up. Me and Paul, we hugged each other. Said, man, I'm sorry. I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. You know, didn't think nothing of it. We get in the car. Tommy Rich said, Tony, you bleeding. Now, we couldn't figure out why I was bleeding. There was no, you know, he missed. He didn't hit me. I didn't hit him. Where the blood come from? So I figured I scraped my scraped my elbow or something on a rock or something. So I pulled down the visor. It had a little mirror, and I saw this little earlobe right here was hanging. Thomas, oh hell! Um, he said your earlobe is bitten, Tony. I said, oh shit! And I said, Paul, you bit my fucking ear. He said, he said, he said, y'all was so scared. He said, you take me, you took me down so quickly. I didn't know what you were gonna do to me while you had me down there. So. Paul said, when uh, Tommy Rich said, Tony, you don't want to go through life with that piece of meat hanging. He said, Let, he said I'll run by the hospital. He said, they could stitch that up in no time. Mm -hmm. So I went to the hospital. They stitched up that little earlobe right here, this, mm -hmm. this little piece here, stitch it up. There we go. That little piece. You can't see it because, you know, uh, it's it been years since it was done. But anyway, make a long story short, the doctor said, I got to hold you overnight. I said, for what? He said, because I gave you a techno shot and we just want to, we have to uh, look, check you out for about overnight to see if you have any effect or anything. Mm -hmm. They said, we do this for all our patients that take a techno shot. So I stayed overnight. Well, like wrestling, it's the wrestling business. The next morning, everybody was telling the story. And everybody that told it to add something, add something to it. Now, if you ever notice when people talk to Paul, he was always very non-talking about it. Mm -hmm. But me and him was friend, the best of friends. He knew the story, but it made him look good. So he didn't want to erase that. He wanted people to really think that he was, you know, this tough SOB. Mm -hmm. And I'm not knocking him, but fighting Paul Norm off was like fighting my a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> he knew nothing about, he was a football player he knew nothing about fighting or wrestling nothing that's why I come it was so easy for me to take him down he didn't know how to he didn't know how to sprawl see with me you shoot from leg I sprawl on you mm -hmm. and I push down on your head at the same time and then I spin around behind you that's what a wrestler do he didn't know that so it was so easy I took him down like if you asked Tommy Rich the fight didn't last more than 30 seconds where is Tommy? But over the years, Tommy could Tom, come in and. Where is Tommy? Is he not here somewhere? He could like stick his head well, in. He, and had say. Go, he had another show to do. He was there last night. He had another show uh, ah. to do. But I saw they asked a uh, Hannibal, uh, the guy in Canada, Hannibal asked Tommy, and Tommy told the truth. Now, Brian Blair lied. I asked Brian why he lied. And he said, Well, you know the business, brother. You have to make it, you have to make it look good. Ah. But Brian Blair lied a lot about about. I saw him doing the thing. In fact, I cut an interview on Brian Blair too. He cursed him out, told him if he keep doing, it, I'm gonna whoop his ass. Cause, Cause Paul didn't like that either. Cause Paul was always afraid that I was going to. In fact, I. That's why me and Paul never had a good match because of that story. You watch a match of me and Paul on I took him. I pressed him over my head like this. I 
couple of times. I set him on the top turnbuckle, and then I patted him on the head. Mm. I, I, yeah. Every time I wrestled Paul, that, what they did to me, if Paul was that tough, why he let me do that to him in front of 20,000 people? I remember, um, this is obviously, it's before I was born when this actually happened, but uh, you and Paul for the WWF, probably for Tuesday Night Titans, you had like a pose down at one point, didn't you? Now, now here's a, here's a funny thing. You know where he threw that cake in my face? Go on. I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, really? When me and Vince Jr. did stuff like that to me, why, I don't know. He always liked to fuck with me. I, I don't know why. He always had an animosity towards me. He said, we're going to do a pose down. So we did the pose down. Then Paul came out and threw the cake in my face. Because you see how Vince and them jump off the stop for going out for him? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. And then Vince go, no, Tony, no, Tony, no. Because I didn't know it was going to happen. I did not know it was going to happen. Another time that Vince pulled a surprise on me, when me, I was doing an interview and Vince wanted me to pose, just posing again. And Hogan came out. I didn't know who was going to come out. When me and Rocky lost the title, I didn't know we were going to lose the title. Really? Vince didn't tell me. He told Rocket, but not me. So I asked Rocket later. I said, Rocket, why y'all didn't tell me? He said, because he knew Vince, Vince knew you would not go for it. So I'm going to tell you something else that nobody knows. Yeah, go on. I'm the only, I was at WrestleMania 1. That's another question that's going to come up, in fact. Why were you not on the card for WrestleMania 1? Because I got a, I, I showed a picture. A guy sent me a picture. The guy that, that do my uh, Twitter page, Matthew, at, at, at Real Atlas, he could send you a picture if you ask him. Mm -hmm. I press slam Hogan up Bundy in his earlier years. Okay. I press slam Bundy on, yeah. on, on TV in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He was wearing a purple one-piece suit. <laughs> he had long hair. He was wrestling under his real name. Oh yeah, of course. He was a he was That's pretty much right. a job. He was pretty much like a jobber, wasn't he, at the time? He was a jobber. Yeah, yeah he wore like a purple suit. And he had long hair, kind of like one man game. And and this is a story. I try to make it quick. Mm -hmm. There were squash matches back then. There was only like two, three minute matches. A squash match, they used to call them. And they would shoot guys out there because they had to do they, they did TV every three weeks. But he, but they have to do uh, three weeks of TV uh, taping. The, what they did, it really did six weeks, believe it or not, because they always want to be a week ahead. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. They didn't want to do three weeks because at the end of three weeks, you got to do more taping. So now, now y'all, so they would do six weeks of taping. So they always have be three weeks ahead of the TV. So they would send guys in the ring, and then the 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 star or the guy that's going over would go in on camera. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the, the jobber would always be in the ring. You ever know that the jobber was already in the ring when, yeah, the, no when the entrance, TV come on? No music, no huh? entrance. Yeah, that's how they did it. Yeah, because yeah. They, they didn't want a jobber to come in on camera. That You, they, you pay for that time, you were not worth the time. So they would have the, 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 the top guy or whoever's going to win to come out on camera. I looked, and uh, the guys were standing through the curtain, and they were looking through the curtain. And I hear S.D. Jones say this, boss man to get him. Yeah, boss man to get him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw him in the gym day. He did 565. He, he's not that heavy. Boss man to get him up. Boss man to get him up. He get him up. He get him up. I said, what the hell are they talking about? So they, they, they say, from Roanoke, Virginia, at 265-pound Mr. USA Tony. So I came through the curtain. I saw Bundy for the first time I walked through that curtain. I turned and looked at Vince, and I gave him a dirty look. I said, you trying to fuck me again. I'm on TV. This is, this is my finishing move. If I don't get this guy up, I'm done. I'm done. Why? I'm thinking, why would you put this guy in the ring with me? I, I'm, I'm really pretty damn angry to be truthful with it. Mm -hmm. So I get in the ring. I was trying to work with Bundy. Where Bundy was light as a father. I mean, he was taking hip toss, and you know, he just looked fat. He was freaking great. So now come the time for the finish. Bundy jumped from the ground to here. 
So I didn't have to, because I couldn't get him, because he was so big, you know, from here to mm -hmm. here. But I knew once I got him here, he got to go. He got to go. So I see, I, I could see Vince Jr., Vince Sr., all the Asian, everybody is peeking through the curtain. Took him to the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. Boom. And then I come back to the dressing room, as you said, I told you. I told you. <laughs> they never showed that match. Really? No, because what impressed them more than the press now was the way Bundy moved. Then they sent him away. Then there was WrestleMania. A guy sent me a picture that he was at WrestleMania one of me and a girl that I was dating. In fact, the girl I was dating is a witness to Jimmy Slooker killing that girl. Her name was Lisa. Mm -hmm. But she was dating Jimmy Slooker and him and that, that girl that Jimmy Slooker killed, yeah. they were best friends. Two Puerto Rican girls. They, they were friends. She was in the room with Slooker, hit her and kill her. And anyway, we walking out the door and the guy took a picture of me going to WrestleMania one. I had a silver suit on. I was there. I was in the territory. You can look all this up. Arnold Scola met me at the door. He told me this. Said, Tony, Vince want to use you for the next one. You got the night off. I was on my way to the garden. He said, you got the night off. He gave me $2,500 in cash, had me to sign the check, you know, so I could endorse the check. He gave me, me and Lisa went out party. I never thought nothing of it. The next day, SD said, oh, boss man, uh, uh, Bozer had a day off. He said, they called me for the big show. Yeah. SD took my place. So you were meant to be wrestling King Kong Bundy that night then? And they replaced me with SD. Were you supposed to lose in nine seconds like It didn't SD matter. Did? No? It didn't matter with Tony Atlas. That's uh -huh. what they didn't want. That's what they did not want. I got the picture on the phone. I was showing it to Chris yesterday. I got a picture of me pressing him at Allentown TV. I even did a drawing of it. I, I cut his hair off so people know who it was. Mm. I didn't do that. I drew Bundy face, but then I shaved his head so people know it was him. And Bundy would tell you if he was alive. He said, yeah, Tony Atten was the only guy that ever got me. In fact, when I was wrestling Bundy, they wanted Bundy to, to beat me in like five minutes. We went 20 minutes. Vince jumped on Bundy and said, I told you to do it in five minutes. He said, he said, he said, I'm a worker, not a fighter. He said, what I'm gonna do with a guy that could press me over his head. <laughs> and they told me never to do that again to I've, him. I've, but it was building him for Hogan. I, but have you ever thought Tony Atlas is in the territory? You could look all this up. I was in the territory at the time. Why would they put the biggest show that they ever had? Why would they put SD and not me? Exactly. People that never dawned on people. Why SD? <laughs> So, I've got to ask this then. So, originally for WrestleMania 1, uh, so it wasn't going to be a short match, but do you think that... Was King Kong Bundy going to go up for you again? Is that what you're saying? Dude, I don't care. Oh, you were just going to do it either way? <laughs> I don't care. I had a clinger jerk, brother. You asked what... Most of you guys are dead. I used to clean and jerk 420 pounds. I used to do curls with 250 pounds. I used to bench press 650. I squatted 800. It didn't matter. To me, it was that's how I come out. I was able to do it. I look at people as weight. Mm -hmm. If I could do 420, I could do Bundy. If I, you know, whatever, because the tricep. See? Mm hmm. I had these huge triceps. Arnold Swarty, that's what Arnold called me. He called me Tricep Man. <laughs> Once I got you here, I could push you. I was a Virginia weightlifter chap. When I was 19, I had a 350 pound clinging jerk. When I was eight, 19, 18 years old, I was putting 350 on my head. Mm. And I wasn't even on the juice then. When I got on the juice, that shot up to, to a, a, a fourth. Sometimes I did 425. Yeah. yeah, I used to take five fifty, brother, and do five reps with it. Oh, man, you asked Steve Riga. I went to his gym in, in Germany, and I did six fifty in Germany for reps. He says a picture on the wall of, of me doing it at a gym that Steve Riga used to work out there in in Germany. They all knew that. 
I would do 400 for 20 reps with a girl standing on my face. <laughs> I was doing the gym. I get a girl. I lay on the bed. She would stand on my face and lift the weights off to me. I used to do 500 pounds in the ring with no warm-up. What do you do now? They would put, yeah, they would, they would do that at matches. Mm. They would put the, the weight in the ring. I would come out and take the 500. One tab, this is funny. I know we got short tab. No, no. Skip Young in Georgia was my tag team partner. Me and Skip went to the gym together, and they were Sweet Brown Sugar Skip Young. So he was supposed to spot me. But I guess Dusty wanted, he was glory hound, wanted to be part of the show. He didn't want, <laughs> yeah, Dusty wanted to be in there. And I got a picture of that too. Dusty took in a, uh, uh, say, I'm spotting you. Now, Dusty never worked out a day in his life. <laughs> he want to spot me. So I said, okay, Dusty. So I said, all you got to do is you stand here. And when, and when I nod my head like this, he me to wait. He go, okay. So I get on the bench. I nod my head. Dusty him in the ring. Then Dusty started jumping up and down, clapping. <laughs> I'm on the bench with 500 pounds. <laughs> the bench is going everywhere. First, the bench was here. When I do the when I do the bench press, it was like this. <laughs> and I'm telling Tito Santana, he was wrestling then as Richard Blood, which is Ricky Steamboat's real name. He was wrestling as Richard Blood, him and a guy named Charlie Smith. And I said, Charlie, tell Dusty to stop. <laughs> and so does the fan and look and saw the thing. You know, oh, okay. And so I did the 500. And then I said, Dustin, what were you doing? He said, I'm trying to get the people going. <laughs> but you ask any of the guys, I could walk right in and do 500. I take it. So I, would, I had this incredible, incredible strength. Imagine if you'd said, Dusty, stand on my face first and then I'll bench it. At least you could stop him from jumping around afterwards. I should have had the girl to stand on my face <laughs> there, you know? But I hear, like, Honker Talk said that I, I jerk off and I do all this stuff. That's why I put out that video. Because mm -hmm. now you can see what I do. I got a very high tolerance to pain. Mm. That's why You'd I never lost a fist fight in the street. When I used a street fight, nobody could beat me because you, I have a very... I got a low tolerance to drug and a high tolerance to pain. All wrestler did. If you had a low tolerance to pain, you could not wrestle Wahoo McDaniel. You could definitely could not wrestle Johnny Valentine. Johnny didn't no. throw no working punches. The, Larry the Axe Henny, funny story. I get in the ring and I'm doing this. Make my booze jumps, right? <laughs> so Larry the Axe Henny said, hey, that's great. He said, I'm going to back up to the rope. I'm gonna hit you. Don't sell it. Make your book, you know, make your chest jump. I said, okay. He backed me to the rope. He hit me, knocked me through the rope. So I get back here. Larry said, kid, I this is in Florida. Kid, I told you not to sell it. So he hit me again, knocked me through the rope again. <laughs> he's ribbing me now. And I, he pulled me in the third time. He said, he's laughing now. He can't help himself. <laughs> and he said, don't sell it. I said, well, don't hit me so damn hard. <laughs> <laughs> but they laid, that's how they, they work stiff. That, that was old school wrestling. They, when they hit you, they knock you in the dirt. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so that, if, if you couldn't take it, it was very, very hard at that time to be a wrestler. Is uh, Chris waiting next to you, waiting to drag Chris you Chris is right here, yes. I knew yep. he was. Right, he wants, right you, you want me to wrap up, don't you, Chris? Yes. Okay, then I will wrap up then. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, before I go, Tony, hit me with some plugs. Where can we find you on social media? You've got a book out. Tell me all about that. Okay. Uh, I don't know much about my... Uh, 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 I'm just learning that computer stuff. But uh, a guy started me a, a, a website. Uh, I don't know if you could... That card is no good. But 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 most of the people that contact me on my Twitter page with it at Real Atlas. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna look. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is uh for my uh. Back, turn it back a little bit. Okay. There you go. Is that a wrestling that license is, or? Well, yeah, that's my website. And the guy that put it up for me, he told me to put that number at the bottom there. That thing. 
There we go. I'll tell you what then. What I'll do is I'll get everybody, uh, every single video because that we they, put out. You know that a lot of people, a lot of people had websites of me, but they're not my site. James, I'll send all this to you, James. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll get all the links. I'll get all the stuff. I'll find out where the book is. I will link it to every video. Yeah, I'll, and we'll get some I'll, books. I'll sold. Co- the book is, is Crowbar Press. For Scott Teal, Crowbar Press. Yeah. Okay, I will advertise all that, but Chris is waiting to drag you off right now. So I will thank you so much for your time, Tony. It was a pleasure. There was a ta- there was a part two, three, four, all the questions that we didn't get to. I'd love you to have you back on again. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you again next time.